It doesn't matter where you are in the structure, that you can be part of this process and actually make a large contribution to it and really be part of the collaboration. All right, it's Wednesday, and this is the Pencil Kings podcast. I'm well, I'm always excited to talk to our guests, but today I think you're going to be excited because we're talking to somebody who has worked at the, the great big studios in the sky. We're talking to Noah Klocek, and I just want to welcome you to the call, Noah, and I feel um, hum- humbled in your presence that, that um, I'm able to talk to somebody like you, and uh, I feel grateful for this opportunity. So yeah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. That's very kind of you. So for those of you who may not know you by name, could you tell us a, like some of the projects or something that, um, that some of the things that you've worked on that people could maybe sort of create an anchor in their mind because they've certainly seen your work before? Yeah. Um, for the last 10 years, uh, I've been working at Pixar, uh, mostly as an art director. I've done a production design to short and done a lot of concept work on films uh, like WALL-E and Up and Partly Cloudy was the short. Um, just finished up Dino, uh, The Good Dinosaur, and um, before that I worked at DreamWorks, and before that I actually worked at ILM for a while, and then before that I worked in advertising while I was in school. And okay. Yeah, and all, all along in the background I'd been trying to get into children's books. That was like my first artistic love when I was a child, and my first book comes out in October, so that's exciting as well. And where's your book going to be available? Um, pretty much everywhere. Amazon in almost every country has it now, um, if you're not in the U.S. And in the U.S., uh, Barnes & Nobles, your local bookstore, it's going to be uh, all over the place. Awesome. Yeah. And um, why don't we just throw out the title of the book? Um, because this podcast episode is going to be coming out right when your book is going to be launching. So it, if somebody's listening and they wanted to go pick it up or they're going to a bookstore, that they're probably going to see it at you know shortly after they listen to this. Absolutely. It's called Cloud Country. And um, it was a collaboration with myself and Bonnie Becker. And it comes out October 13th in the U.S. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I'm really curious how how you got started because I feel that so many people have this a goal or a dream that they would like to work at um, Disney or Pixar. These two companies are sort of well now they're the same company, yeah. but for a long time they they weren't, but but they're still sort of separate as far as I understand yes, it. That's correct. Um, like there's there's Pixar movies and then there's Disney movies. Yeah. Um, but where did you you know where did this all begin? Um, for me, it. it was childhood. Um, both my parents have masters in fine art, but ended up in education. And so as a child, I was surrounded by a lot of art. However, they were also super progressive and we didn't have a TV or much media at all. And so it was mostly uh, books that was my first inspiration. And I actually went to art school after going to junior college and trying everything else uh, besides art. Um, I decided I really wanted to be an artist, and so I went to San Jose State for art school. And it was there that I was really introduced to um, the possibility of working in the film industry. And while I recognized that that was a job and that someone was doing that, I had never really had the thought that that could be me. And so while I was in school, um, it was an animation illustration program. So I was exposed to the computer, and but we did a lot of traditional animation and then a ton of illustration and visual development at the time. And in my last year of college, I was lucky enough to get picked up um, by ILM to work in their matte painting department. And so um, that was a kind of being dunked in the deep end of the pool. And I had to learn really fast. Um, and after a time there, um, I got laid off, which at the time was the most terrifying thing I could imagine. But it ended up being really good for me because it kind of said, what do you want to do with your career now and your artistic skills? And I really wanted to get into animation because I loved the idea of creating worlds from scratch. 
um, when I was working in at ILM, we ended up, you know, getting plates a lot of the time, and we'd like extend a building or add telephone poles or take telephone poles out of a shot. And I really wanted to be part of that, creating a world from the ground up, like I imagine you do in child, children's books. And okay, and so that yeah, was that kind works. of the dream, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I guess it. For a lot of the time, I hadn't thought of the two things separately, but I, I can now – just hearing you say that, I can really understand people's um, – why they're drawn to wanting to create their own own worlds and their own universes. Um, Absolutely. That it's – yeah. That there's – it's like everything has to be touched. Everything has to be thought of. Exactly. And, and that's really cool. And it, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity to really say something about – Every little thing. And I think part of it was just the way that ILM was, is structured is very, um, very rigid structure. And so I was more of a wrist than I was of a thinker. And I really wanted to be, you know, coming up with ideas and be part of the process. So I was lucky enough to get picked up by DreamWorks. And I worked there for a number of years in uh, the Matt Payne department as well. And then I kind of was like, well, I really want to be in the art department. And they said, that would be great, but we want you to stay in the math department and at the time, my wife had uh, gotten a job at Pixar. We met in school. And so we were commuting in opposite directions, and it was crazy. And uh, I went to a rap party for Pixar, for The Incredibles that she worked on, and a rap party for Madagascar uh, a week apart. And the rap party at Pixar, all John Lasseter and everyone got up and Steve Jobs, and all they talked about was how much they love filmmaking. And at the same time, Jeffrey Katzenberg got up, and all he talked about was the money that the film was going to make. And I realized I, I have to find a way to get into Pixar. So um, I had my wife turn in my portfolio, and Ralph Eggleston saw it, who's a pr fantastic production designer there from the beginning. Um, he was a production designer on Toy Story. Um, saw it and he brought me aboard and so I've been working there for 10 years and um, it's the most amazing place for collaboration ever in the world I think I feel really lucky to be working there <laughs> yeah I can I can only imagine I, I've never had the I've worked with really great teams before but I've never I don't think I've ever had that experience of feeling like um, you're on this mission that's so much bigger than your project. The project's important, but there's something magical about just the studio and, and the people um, that are there and, and the vision that they have for where you guys are going. Yeah, I, I think that is one of the major things that sets it apart is that it it is almost always the case that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And the feeling of that is being... Because, uh, you know, there's very few individual contributors there. I mean, we all do artwork and concept work and all that kind of stuff. But it's very different than my book work, which is very individual and it's kind of my vision. Uh, at Pixar, it's all about the collaboration. And so, uh, and, you know, it's not without its issues and problems and not every film is easy and smooth. But at the heart of it all is that desire for everyone to get the best ideas up on film. And uh, it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. It doesn't matter who has it. If we can all come together and, and make something bigger together than we could have ever made by ourselves, that's kind of the end goal. And more often than not, it happens. And it's pretty um, magical to be part of that. And how, how do you think that comes about? Or I, like, I feel like it's a cultural thing yes. like when they talk about co company culture. But... Um, I think it's from the top, you know, so that if you have people at the top who are willing to listen to any idea and really take it on its merit and not um, dismiss it because it's coming from someone who's new or someone who's less experienced, um, that really fosters a sense of community and shared ownership and all of those things that we value in collaboration. And that is really something that Pixar has excelled in is is keeping that flame alive that it doesn't matter where you are in the structure that you can be part of this process and actually make a large contribution to it and really be part of the collaboration um, and it's not a perfect system I don't want to you know uh, 
give people unrealistic expectations. It's really challenging at times, and sometimes it doesn't work that well. And there's people who are disgruntled, and there's still politics, and there's still egos. But compared to any place else I've worked, it it fosters that from the top down. Yeah, that, and I don't know. I've just got a, a big smile on my face now. Like I feel like, man, I want I, one day. I want to get to Pixar just to take a tour. I don't know if you guys do tours, but um, just to just to see sort of like the magic factory and and what's going on there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm. I have to ask this question on behalf of so many people that have come to me. Um, and is there a I don't want to say there's a secret because it's a lot of hard work and um, there's a lot of things that go into this, but I feel that Pixar and Disney, they're so they're perched so high in our minds that it's very difficult for us as, you know, somebody working in our parents' basement on our art and watching these movies and feeling inspired and coming up with our own characters and putting them online and, you know, maybe getting a, a lukewarm response or whatever. And you're like yeah. saying to yourself, one day I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to work there. But it's actually, they've put it so high in their mind that there's like a mental block that's saying, even if they don't acknowledge it, that's saying that they can't get there because it's too high. Yeah. And what would you say to somebody like that? Because I really believe that you know, anything is possible. There's nothing really holding us back except ourselves most of the time. Yeah, that is, that's well put. And I, I really discourage people of putting individuals or even organizations on pedestals like that. Uh, you know, I'm just a person. I put stuff online all the time that gets a lukewarm response. Uh, um, that really shouldn't be what you value yourself as an artist is where you work or what title you have or um, how many accolades you have or awards. It's really, and I know that's you know easy for me to say, um, but really I think that the, 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 at the heart of it, if you're doing work you believe in and work that, that you feel strongly about, there's story after story after story of artists who no one knew their work and um, especially in fine art, where they were actually ridiculed by the establishment and then became the thing that we remember about that era, the Impressionists or the Group of Seven in Canada. There's so many examples where the art establishment said, this is no good, this is not, and they stuck with it because they believed in the, in the art that they were making or the stories that they were telling. And so I wouldn't look at Pixar as necessarily the goal. I would look at um, becoming the best artist that I can be as the goal. And if Pixar's in the cards, that's great. If But Pixar started from people with ideas and there will be another Pixar and there'll be another Disney. And um, don't look at it as a failure if you're not at a large company like this. Look at it as a failure if you stop doing the art that you love or get discouraged by you know trolls online who don't like the style of the work that you're doing that should not be your value structure. It should be all about the content that you're creating and the belief in the stories and the art that you're making. I, I think that's the perfect response. And if you're listening and, and, and you, you have those aspirations. I would encourage you to hit rewind and listen to about the last two minutes of what Noah just said, uh, you know, one or two times because um, there's opportunities all over the place Absolutely. to, to, you know, have your work get put on a, on a larger stage or even just get out there into the world because there's, there's only so much that you can do by yourself. But once right. you start collaborating with other people, all of a sudden now, like there's something that's much bigger and you never know where these things are going to, going to end up. That is exactly right. And there's a small company somewhere now, it may be a game company, it may be a mobile game company where there's a group of people who are passionate about creating something bigger than themselves. And that thing will be the next Thing that the world knows and loves and cares about and they'll be making the future films that of you know the style of Pixar and be that name and so 
it's not about achieving um, necessarily. And if you want to work at Pixar, that's a great aspiration if that's what helps you drive your artistic journey. But I think the goal is to really connect with people and make collaboration and make art that you're proud of. And again, I got to call this out, but if you've been listening to the podcast regularly, collaboration is another one that's come up time and time and time again. And there's starting to be these themes that I'm realizing yeah. where, you know, if you're by yourself, reach out to somebody, see if there's something that you can do together. And I think that's maybe an interesting segue. And I'm curious what your collaboration was on um, the book that that's coming out. Yeah. So that's actually a, a great segue. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, when I was young, uh, I looked at um, illustrators that I liked, like Trina Shart Hyman, who was a book illustrator in the 80s and 90s, and uh, Alan Moore and uh, or Alan Lee and uh, Moore, who did the Lord of the Rings work now. But uh, they were like out in the middle of the English countryside illustrating by themselves. And I thought that that would be my life. Um, but the thing that I've learned when I went to school, we had an animation illustration club at San Jose State called the Shrunken Headman that really was integral in me becoming the artist I am. And that's because I was exposed to other art, I was exposed to other artists and seeing the work that they were doing and they were my peers and the work was better than the work I was doing. It drove me to do better work. And so when I started my children's book work, I was again all by myself just doing this art and writing and writing and writing. And that got my foot in the door um, for someone saying, hey, I think that you can do this. But when I was working on early on Cloud Country, I have five versions of Cloud Country that uh, will never be released. And that we, for a number of reasons, were turned down by my editor or we agreed it didn't work completely. And it wasn't until Bonnie Becker came on that we had this collaboration of ideas. So I had created this whole world with Gail and these guardians. And she was able to go into that world and take those characters and come up with different ideas that I didn't have um, that really sparked my imagination. And so now I've kind of got a group of people around me that um, I know from the children's book world that we share our work amongst each other to get pointers and to help us grow um, because you can't work in a vacuum. Um, and it's really disheartening if you work in a vacuum and use online as your litmus test or what you're looking at, because online it's, um, you know, the Facebook effect where people are only showing their, their good work or you're only seeing people get a bunch of hits and you're not getting any hits. You really have to go to the individual level and actually have deeper conversations about art because it's not about uh, click baiting. That's not what we're trying to do with art. We're trying to actually elevate the discussion and elevate storytelling and elevate those kind of things. And if it's all just about how many hits you have online, you're not going to be creating the best work that you can be creating. And so I think that that's why it's about collaborating with individuals. And how did you go about setting up, um, like you mentioned, now you have this group. Is it is it a group that you meet uh, in person or is it something that you do online? Uh, sometimes some of the people we meet, we meet um, in person and we don't have a formal like coming together um, all the time. But I'll go and have dinner with one of my friends and we'll both bring our latest project and we'll kind of talk about children's books and the, the struggles with it and editors and, you know, um, what we like in children's books and books that came out and how hard it is to market your book and all this stuff. But then we'll also sit down and talk about our stories. And, well, this is interesting. What if you took this in a different direction? And so I kind of have a group that I meet with individually to bounce my ideas off of. And they kind of give me really great criticism, but it's not a, a negative, it's constructive. And that's what I think that you can find online, but it's not on social media. Social media is an instant thing, um, and your conversations about artwork and creativity need to be longer than that. They need to be really about substance and and nuance. And Twitter is not great at that. While I love Twitter, um, it's not <laughs> great at doing that. And so I think that if you have that, the other thing that it's a, an advantage if you have that community around you when you put stuff on Twitter and it has a poor response then it's not about you because you're still creating the work that you want to be creating and you've talked to people you care about and valued their opinion. And so you can go through 
times where, you know, your work isn't connecting with the zeitgeist of the time, and that's okay. Most of our work is not going to, um, but that doesn't mean it's not important. such great advice and just to add my two cents to this i i've if if you're alone right now and you are looking to form a group i you know you can create these little small private groups in facebook uh, which yeah. i found are very effective because we're often on facebook so much but then it's just contained in your little thing and so That's you right. have your you know your five close friends and then um just like what noah's saying you can allow that conversation to develop over time and those people can get to know you better and and know how to give you better feedback so i think it's it's such a we live in such an amazing time for collaboration yeah. but we also live in such a maybe like a demoralizing time where you can just flip on any, you know, Tumblr page and like, Oh, this is, I'm not good enough for this. I'm yes. not as good as this guy. What, who, what do I have any right to, to say this about, about this story or how could I ever create something? It's already been done before, but it's, that's not what is really happening. That's absolutely true. I think it's just, we're exposed to all of it. I think, you know, there may have been times in history where not as many people are creating as much art, but now you can see it all immediately. And that can be really challenging. I mean, it, it's demoralizing to me sometimes where I go and see all the amazing work that's going on and the, you know, children's books are in the world and think, wow, I got to get drawing. Look at these young kids doing such amazing work. Um, I, you know, I wasn't doing work like that when I was their age, um, but that's all okay. You know, um, as long as, you know, you continue to do the work. I mean, my children's book work is done between eight and midnight every night because that's after my kids go to bed and that's the only time I have to do it. And I don't want to shortchange their childhood for my pet projects. Um, and so it is a very um, unrelenting and unglamorous time to be doing work <laughs> every night, but I value that work enough and I'm getting modest feedback on it, but I, I really don't have a groundswelling of, wow, this is amazing work. But it's it, it, that important to me, so I keep keep at it. All right, I, I think I've got time for one more question here, Noah. Yeah. And again, I'm going to ask because so many people ask this, and they want to become better storytellers. And um, I look at people's work, and I feel like. Well, actually, I'll let you answer it, but I see a lot of people's work, and it's like it's a character, and he's standing there, yes. and they're like, "I want to be a better storyteller." And so, what's your take on that, or what? What? How can people dig deeper um, so that they are starting to tell a story instead of just a, a you know the the figure may be in a pose, but right. it's still not going as deep as they need to. Yeah, this is a fantastic question, and I actually have a whole lecture on this, and so I could oh. speak for an hour. But the for me, the difference is research. And people find, hear the word research and they think like looking at a couple of cool pictures on Tumblr uh, and research is not about that. Research is about authenticity. And so if you're designing a character who's lived in, you know, uh, the Midwest in the 20s, um, don't look at other people's work of artists or uh, of designs from the 20s. Go and look at photographs from the 20s in the Midwest um, and really go deep. You know, um, I'm going to hopefully be teaching a class next uh, quarter um, here in Berkeley where uh, I give you two weeks for assignment and the first week is all research. And the idea is that you want to get as much information as you can about that, as much. So I mean hundreds and hundreds of pictures and images and things that spark it. And maybe it's a, you know, a pattern on a tablecloth. And maybe it's the way that, you know, uh, pants that someone wore get worn out over a certain period of time because of the job that you do, because you're a farmer and you're on your knees. The knees get worn out more than the cuffs of the pants. All these things. And you want to gather as much as you, that as you can and bring it into yourself until it becomes part of you and you really understand 
the very small nuances of who that character is and why they're doing what they're doing and the emotional state and gather reference on emotional state. If your character is distraught and um, isolated and poor, look at pictures of people who are distraught and isolated and poor and bring all of that information. You can look at other artists too for inspiration, but it really is digging deep in the, in the reference phase. And then you have that all and you can put it away and start drawing and you'll start drawing from a place of knowledge instead of a place of uh, caricature and uh, habit. And you don't want to be drawing from a place of habit because that makes things, like you said, there is a character who's just standing there and they're not telling a story. If you don't have the tools to tell the story and you don't really understand who that character is and what they've been through and the history of that place and time, how can you build a character that is telling the story? And so I really encourage people to spend a ton of time doing research and bringing that into their work. And that immediately will add a level of uh, authenticity and quality to the work that they're doing. That's so fantastic. And it's something that we are talking about inside the community, about people um, drawing without doing any research yeah. or any reference and how it was just, you know, they felt like they were stuck, but it's like, you're missing the crucial part that's right. not about the drawing. It's the it's what happened be before the drawing. Before so. the drawing. Yeah, it's not drawing from that reference. It's not copying that guy. It's understanding why the pants are worn the way that they are. That is yeah. the crucial stuff that helps with storytelling. All right. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, any any last words? Uh, we try to keep these nice and short and sweet. And I think this is a, a great little interview. But anything else before we sign off today? Um, no, just don't stop drawing. <laughs> All yeah. right. So um, we will have show notes for this at pencilkings.com slash Noah Klocek. So that'll be N-O-A-H dash K-L-O-C-E-K. We'll have links to Noah's book um, as well as links to Noah's website. Is Image Block, is that your yep, best website? That is. All right. Imageblock.com and um, links to anything else we can find on Noah. So thank you so much for taking this interview. I think there was a lot of amazing uh, insight that we have and I hope that, um, I don't know, I hope if somebody's listening to this that they you can listen to it and take action on, on something that Noah's talked about. And I would love to hear about it um, because that's why we do these interviews so that you can get in touch with people and you don't have to bring them up. I'll do it for you. And then uh, you could have the, the result of it. So thanks again, Noah. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Mitch. Thank you so much. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.